and welcome to our second show of Truths of the Bible. I'm Joaquin Pinto, and this is Anthony Mosca. Today we'll be talking about Noah's Ark. Noah preached for 120 years to, for the people to repent of their evil deeds because the world was wicked and evil at that time. And Noah made an ark for, the, for, hi, for him and his family and all the people that would be saved. But the only people that were saved was eight people, and that was Noah and his family. They gave their hearts to the Lord. And Noah and his family, they spent one year in the ark, and the rest of the earth was destroyed because of the wickedness of all of the people. Noah's Ark. Before the great flood, the world had become filled with wicked men, so much so that the Lord decided to destroy the face of the earth. Genesis 6, 13. God said to Noah, I intended to make an end of all flesh, for through man the land is filled with violence, and behold, I will destroy them and the land. The Lord sent two of each species of animals to be with Noah upon the ark to be saved from the flood so that they would not be all destroyed when the Lord destroyed the earth with all the wicked men that were living at that time. The Lord chose Noah, a man of God, to build an ark in which the righteous would be saved along with some of the animals. Noah preached of conversion and repentance for 120 years, but only eight people gave their hearts to the Lord and entered the ark. The rain came and the people sought the safety of higher ground or the ark itself but the angel of the Lord had closed the door of the ark, and it could not be opened. Probation had closed. It was too late. Death and destruction covered the earth. The thoughts of man were evil continually. God extended an invitation, but it was not accepted. Genesis 7, 11, 12. In the year 600 of Noah's life, in the 17th day of the second month, that same day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and burst forth, and the windows and the floodgates of the heavens were opened, and it rained upon the earth forty days and forty nights. Genesis 7.23 God destroyed, blotted out every living thing that was upon the face of the earth. Men and animals and the creeping things and the birds of the heavens were destroyed, blotted out from the land. Only Noah remained alive and those who were with him in the ark. God had saved his people through the flood, but they would spend almost one year in the ark, waiting for the floodwaters to recede and new life to begin. Noah and his family were anxious to leave the ark. Finally, Noah knew it was safe to leave. The Lord put a rainbow in the sky to remind him of his covenant with Noah not to destroy the earth with water ever again. That's where the rainbow in the sky comes from. He offered a sacrifice to the Lord, and the Lord placed a bow of promise in the sky that he would never again destroy the earth with a flood. The Bible tells us where the ark of Noah came to rest. The ark rested upon the mountains of Ararat. But what is Ararat? The name Ararat, as it appears in the Bible, is the Hebrew equivalent of Urartu, ancient country of Southwest Asia mentioned in Assyrian sources from the early 13th century BC. This area included parts of Eastern Turkey, Armenia, and Iran. Moses was not speaking of a specific mountain when writing Genesis. He was speaking of a country, Urartu. So the Bible was saying the ark came to rest in the mountains of the country of Urartu. In Eastern Turkey, across the valley from Mount Ararat is the site we will be visiting. An aerial surveyor named Francis Gary Power discovered Noah's Ark in 1959 on the mountains of Uratu in eastern Turkey. Later, Turkish Lieutenant Duripinar spotted the boat-shaped object in these photographs. So in 1960, a group from the United States journeyed to the site but they prematurely concluded it was just a natural formation. That same year, Life magazine featured photos of the site. 
Is there a historical record from ancient civilizations of Noah's Ark existing? Barosus the Chaldean wrote, It is said there is still some part of the ship in Armenia, at the mountain of the Chordeans, and some people carry off pieces of the bitumen, which they take away, and use chiefly as amulets, for the averting of mischiefs. Today, we can look at a map of Turkey, and see this site listed as Nuhun Jimisi, or Noah's Big Boat. Making the trip to the site, we landed next to the very large Lake Vaughan, which once hosted the ancient capital of Urartu named Tushpa, located along its shore. Heading out through the countryside, we see an extinct volcano. Crossing a mountain, we soon see our first glimpse of the famous Mount Ararat in the distance. In the shadows of Ararat is the city of Dobayazit that we pass through, heading toward the Noah's Ark site. Mount Ararat is a beautiful mountain, complete with a rich history of mountain climbers searching for the Ark, but without success. Across the valley, we stop and see the government-erected road sign, Nohan Jimisi, five kilometers up the mountain. In 1977, Ron White made his first trip to the Ark. With his teenage sons, and he prayed that their taxi would stall in the areas where they needed to search. God stalled their taxi in three different locations. And here is our first taxi stop. High on the mountain is the resting place of Noah's ship. The name of this mountain is translated as Doomsday Mountain, named so for the deadly event of the flood. As we drive up the mountain, we can see Lesser Ararat and Greater Ararat across the valley. Both are post-flood volcanic mountains that were not even here during the flood, and they would be the last place one should search for the Ark. We finally made it to the Ark. Looking at it from the stern, or rear, one can see the boat-shaped outline of the Ark. It has a rounded stern and a pointed bow or front. The symmetrical shape indicates that it is a man-made structure Ron Wyatt made 24 trips out here to conduct tests and do research at this boat-shaped formation. Photos taken at different times of the year have brought out different features of the boat. There was so much convincing evidence uncovered at the site that the Turkish government declared this area to be Noah's Ark National Park. And yet today, the world is unaware of this amazing discovery. In 1960, a group from the United States journeyed to Turkey and discovered a symmetrical shape indicating that it's a man-made shape known as Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark National Park was opened on June 21st, 1987, and there's a museum on the site of the Ark. Inside the museum is petrified wood and sea fossils that proves that there was water upon the earth at that time, at that height where the Ark was. They say a light shines from far away from the site, but when you draw near to the site, the light disappears. People cannot figure out why that happens. They're baffled. Using Google Earth, we can zoom in on the site with satellite imagery to see the Ark, and also the visitor center that was constructed by the Turkish government. It was on June 21st, 1987, that a ceremony was held on the mountain to commemorate the site as Noah's Ark National Park. Dignitaries from around the country assembled to break bread and celebrate this wonderful find. The governor, military officers, and other key officials were participating in a celebration of discovery. Ron Wyatt was a special guest because of the extensive work that he had accomplished at the site. The visitor center would welcome guests from around the world to gaze upon the Ark. As concrete was placed in the foundation by the governor and by Ron Wyatt, excitement was in the air. This was a monument to the mortal remains of Noah's Ark. Noah's Ark was found. 
The next day, an article appeared in Turkey's largest newspaper announcing Noah's Big Boat, open for tourism. Now, we make our way inside the visitor center to view the informative evidence on display. Various diagrams and photos are assembled to point out the important features of the Ark. A guest book shows us that people are visiting the site from all over the world. Many different countries are represented here. Hassan Ozer has worked in the visitor center since it opened. He has lived his entire life in a village here on the mountain, just above the Ark, and has a great deal of history associated with the Ark. His photo appeared in a Knoxville, Tennessee newspaper, so our team brought him a laminated copy for his own. Hassan now tells us some interesting history about the Ark formation. In uh, 48, and there was an earthquake, and uh, it was in the nighttime, and uh, we just wake up in the morning, and we see the earth was uh, moved, and uh, uh, we saw the shape like an arc. After uh, that time, there was a, a light we can, could see in the nighttime in the uh, up on the uh, village. When we look uh, down to the ark side, and people was uh, believing that uh, it's holy. Uh, things and they, when they uh, come on to the next to the ark, this uh, light is going off. You know, you cannot find. In my personal uh, thinking is, uh, well, I see after the uh, this earthquake there is a, a shape like a ark, and uh, also was a light which is colored light, uh, uh, green, yellow, and reddish. Uh, uh, lights we saw there and uh, lots of people were in the village they were uh, saying that's the holy place somebody says there was uh, there is a uh, some gold we should go uh, dig it up and stuff like this they say especially when you come next to it it's going uh, off the light you cannot see anymore but he said after the uh, the government confirmed that that's the Noah's Ark there is no light anymore and uh, you know, uh, that's, that's make me uh, think it is Noah's Ark. Do you believe Noah's Ark actually existed? Could the legend that sounds like a fairy tale really become proven fact? Well, the search has been going on since biblical times. And in a moment, you're going to meet some people who are positive they have found the Ark. Now we know such claims have been made before, but a few months ago, these people came to 2020 with some new and intriguing scientific findings. We followed them to the mountains of eastern Turkey. And what you'll see is a bizarre adventure with a host of unlikely characters. Tom Gerald's story takes many twists and turns. That's the seductive beauty that brings them here, snow-capped Mount Ararat. The explorers looked for the ark there since that's the highest point around here. And as the flood waters receded, presumably that's where it would have landed. But the Bible describes the mountains of Ararat, mountains, plural. Is it possible that the Ark came to rest on one of the smaller sister mountains to Ararat? The boat-shaped site was first found and photographed by a Turkish army captain back in 1959. It was quickly explored and dismissed as a freak of nature. But Wyatt, an amateur archaeologist, rekindled interest in it a few years ago. He brought in Dave Fassel, a marine salvage expert, to assess it. The Doomsday Mountain team brought in some high technology to explore the oldest legend of man. They began scanning their site with a molecular frequency generator. It's a device used by surgeons to pinpoint cancer tumors, and it's been used by Fassel to locate underwater treasure. This time, the molecular frequency generator began to pick up a unique pattern of iron lines beneath the earth. Okay, bring that one up. They began placing ribbons along those lines. The finished shape outlined by the ribbons was that of a huge ship, the approximate length and width of Noah's Ark, as described in the Bible. The fascinating field of ribbons soon attracted higher academic interest. That looks like iron. Okay. Dr. John Baumgartner, a physicist with Los Alamos Laboratories, sent samples back to the lab for analysis and confirmed that the metal they were tracing with the ribbons was indeed iron. With the width and the length known, the only remaining question was depth. 
By locating the depth of the hull, they could determine if the boat-shaped object had the cargo capacity described in the biblical ark. They studied the site and found it was man-made because they used highly technological machines to test the area. They say it's a man-made object that's 300 cubits in length and has ribbed timbers along the sides that are still visible. The reflections created a picture of timbers underground. This diagram shows us some of the main structural elements of the ark, including parallel and repeated patterns, indicating a man-made site. Indeed, there is something beneath that rock besides rock. A radar device developed by geophysical survey systems in Hudson was used on the mountain. The device called SIR is used by energy exploration companies to analyze what's below the Earth's surface. According to SIR, something man-made is under Mount Aridog. This data is not, it does not represent natural geology. It's, it's a man-made structure. These reflections are occurring very per periodic, too periodic to be random na natural type interface. Compared to an aircraft carrier 1,000 feet long, we can see the arc is quite large. The Ark was a high-tech vessel that was designed to survive a catastrophic flood that would destroy the surface of the Earth. Complete with a keel, keelsons, and anchor stones, it was truly a work of art designed to save the human race from annihilation. The Bible tells us the Ark was 300 cubits in length. The Ark formation has been measured to be 515 feet long, which is exactly 300 Egyptian cubits. Moses, when writing the Genesis account, would have been accustomed to using the longer Egyptian cubit of 20.6 inches. The Bible mentions an earlier cubit, cubits according to the former measure. This references the Egyptian cubit, which was divided into 28 digits, making up the cubit rod. Many centuries later, the 18-inch Hebrew cubit was developed and implemented. At the Tel Megiddo in Israel, Solomon's gates can be measured to exactly six Egyptian cubits, showing further evidence of its early usage. One can easily see the rib timbers near the stern on the starboard side of the ark. This was part of the superstructure of the ark, much like ships are constructed today. Horizontal boards would have been attached to these vertical ribs. Here we can see vertical fissures between the ribs, these ribs run perpendicular to the mud flow around the structure, indicating once again, man-made construction. Local village boys greet us as we take a look at the starboard side of the ark, which curves uphill toward the front of the ark. This side is predominantly buried in the soil. The outside of the bow, or front, is just before us and then we scan down the starboard side to see the top of the rib timbers. In the distance, we can see Mount Ararat and Lesser Ararat. We now pan over to the port side of the ark near the stern. This side is less preserved, but we can see one large rib timber standing at attention. It has been beautifully preserved and has retained the curvature of the hull. From here we look toward the front of the ark and we can see a large hole which was blown open in 1960 when the first group came here from the United States to inspect the site. We are now standing on the middle deck of the ark and now pan over to the interior of the port side where we can see four horizontal protrusions in a row. They are arranged in a regular pattern, indicating man-made construction. These would have been horizontal deck support timbers, extending toward the middle of the deck. At the stern, we can see the symmetrical shape of the boat, including the center mound, where the decks have collapsed one on top of another. Continuing to inspect the stern, we can see five objects in a row along the inside port area of the deck. These have been measured at regular intervals and appear to be vertical posts that would have supported the deck.
The ark originally came to rest higher on the mountain, but was pulled down to its current location amidst a lava or mud flow, which impaled it on this rock outcropping. Ron Wyatt was operating his ground-penetrating equipment before Turkish authorities when he spotted an object just below the surface. What they found was this beautiful deck timber. It was tested at Galbraith Labs for organic carbon. The level of organic carbon was extremely high, thus proving this object was once living matter consistent with wood. Mr. Wyatt was able to display the deck timber on CNN when he was interviewed on their network. The timber is in three layers, much like plywood, with glue oozing out at the end. This makes it stronger than one solid piece of wood. The outer area is covered in black pitch. Some nails can also be seen on its surface. This layering of wood may have been the gopher wood mentioned in Genesis. Just above the Ark site is the Uzengili village. Its former name in the 19th century was Naser. This pronunciation is similar to Nicer, a village that the Babylonian Barossus described as being near the Ark site. Josephus in the first century said, its remains are shown there by the inhabitants to this day. This would tell us the Ark would be in an accessible location. These local villagers would have had a tourist trade accommodating visitors to the Ark. The visitors to the Ark would have stayed overnight here and would have bought souvenirs in the village. Evidence of this was discovered in 2000 when an archaeologist found this potsherd 20 yards from the Ark. On the concave side, it has a carving of a man using a hammer to drive a nail, much like Noah building the Ark. On the convex side, an ancient ink drawing shows a man releasing birds, matching the biblical narrative of Noah releasing a raven and a dove. This is just another piece of amazing evidence found here at the Ark site. Using radar equipment, Ron Wyatt discovered an open cavity on the starboard side of the Ark. Utilizing a core drilling technique, he was able to gain access to the interior of the Ark. Stunning evidence was pulled from the belly of the ship. Through an open cavity in the belly of the ship, they found a petrified antler and also found cat hair. Using an improvised long rake device, petrified animal dung was extracted from the hull. These are all items that one would expect to find in the bottom of the Ark. This large metal rivet or metal washer around a metal rod was found by Ron Wyatt when he had taken a tour group to the site in 1991. The center rod had been struck while it was hot, causing it to flare out, holding the washer in place. During Ron Wyatt's trip with a metal detector, he discovered a metal washer from the ship that proved to be 8% metal, man-made metal. Test results showed that it contained 8% aluminum metal. Aluminum metal is man-made, thus proving the site to be man-made. Skeptics have said Mr. Wyatt was lying about the testing, but was he really? When the Ark Discovery International team was at the Ark site, they used a metal detector to locate metal fittings on the Ark. This is a crescent-shaped piece of metal that had been a circular washer in its better days and was found near the bow on the port side a portion of it tested at Galbraith Labs in Tennessee, and the results were stunning. It was 8% aluminum metal, just as Ron Wyatt's test had revealed. The test additionally showed a small amount of titanium metal that is also man-made. The Ark Discovery team continued its analysis at the site and located another fitting on the starboard side. A portion of it was sent to Galbraith Labs for testing, and again, there were incredible results. It contained 8% aluminum metal, 1.3% titanium metal, plus 3.8% magnesium metal, all indicative of the Ark formation being a man-made structure. The Encyclopedia Britannica tells us, because of its chemical activity, aluminum never occurs in the metallic form in nature. These unique metal components are special markers that were left behind which proved the site is without a doubt a man-made structure utilizing high-tech construction techniques consistent with what we should find in Noah's Ark.
Modern man didn't discover how to make aluminum metal until around 1900, but the antediluvians had this knowledge in their day. Other metal fittings were found on the port side of the deck. Our metal detector picked up metal readings where a rectangular plate was positioned on a flat plane. This plate originally had six rivets. One is still visible on the left side. After the flood, Noah and his family lived in the village of Kazan, known as the Place of the Eight. This village was known as the Place of the Eight, named so for the eight survivors of the flood. This is the first area that Noah and his family lived after the flood. Large anchor stones were found for the rear of the ark to stabilize the ark from huge waves that would come upon the ark. It created a type of resistance in the water, allowing the rounded rear of the ark to fend off powerful waves that would critically damage the ark if struck broadside. Measuring 11 feet in height, with four feet embedded in the ground, it is actually the largest and most beautiful anchor stone found to date. A tapered hole was drilled into the top of each anchor stone, a five inch opening on one side and a seven inch opening on the other, allowing a rope to be pulled through and a knot tied. It was designed to be lifted while in the water when it would weigh less, thereby preventing the top from breaking off. The most striking feature is the crosses that have been carved on the anchor stone. Early Christians came through this area and recognized these objects as biblical items from the ark. They carved crosses on these anchor stones, representing Noah and his family. The largest cross here represents Noah and is of the Crusader style. The diamond shape with a cross above was Nimrod's sign when he was alive. The diamond represents the ark that he took credit for. Then the vertical line is the pathway to heaven, with the crossbar representing heaven. The Egyptians had an adaptation of this symbol called the Ankh. This stone has a large cross representing Noah. The next smaller cross on the bottom left is Mrs. Noah. The next three smaller crosses represent the three sons. Then the three smallest represent the wives of the sons. This stone does not have any carvings on it, but it does have a hole drilled through the top other stones have been found buried, but they have no inscriptions. Five crosses are on this anchor stone, and as we look at the top, we can see where the hole has been broken off. In 1977, Ron Wyatt discovered Noah's home. It was built in the village of Kazan, known as the Place of the Eight. This photo was taken in 1977 by Ron Wyatt, showing the walls of Noah's home since then, all the walls have been torn down by local treasure seekers. In the front yard stood this large tombstone. On the tombstone was a drawing of eight people and a boat on a wave. Noah's wife's grave was looted for millions of dollars and sold on the black market. Uphill, behind Noah's home, is this large altar that he would have used to sacrifice animals to the Lord. It is approximately 10 feet in diameter and has a cube-like shape. In conclusion, we can say that the Durupanar, Noah's Ark formation, is full of evidence which confirms its authenticity, especially when we objectively consider all the information. Many books have been written about the discovery of the Ark. It has been featured in many newspapers and television programs, but most of the world is not aware of this beautiful discovery, which refutes evolution and proves the Bible to be truth. In God's timing, He will reveal this to all mankind. We want to thank you for watching our show on Noah's Ark in the beautiful Greenwood Lake. Tune in next week when we will discuss the topic of the Red Sea crossing. I'm Joe Acupinto. This is Anthony Mosca. We'll see you next week on Truths of the Bible. Thank you and God bless. All our